Hello, good evening. So happy to see everybody here. Um, I am Susan Jester. I am the research director at the Huntington Library. I'm the newly appointed research director, and it is thrilling for me to be here um, on this amazing occasion. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's um, Distinguished Fellow Lecture by Professor Andreas Resendez. There's a really wonderful serendipity tonight between past and present. I am myself am a, a, a past Ritchie Distinguished Fellow. We're gathered together here in the Ritchie Auditorium to hear a talk by the current Ritchie Fellow. So there's a theme here, and the theme is Roy Ritchie. So tonight allows us to both honor the field of early American history as represented by Roy's own work and his foundational leadership of the Huntington Research Program, and to celebrate a scholar whose work embodies really exciting new directions in the field. Andreas is by training a historian of colonial Latin America. And he, along with many others, have been instrumental in helping the field of early America expand beyond its geographic and thematic borders to encompass the wider world of oceanic ebbs and flows, thematic um, of hemispheric systems of enslavement and coercion, of multilingual and multiracial empires contending for supremacy. Our field has truly become, in the, worlds of the Omaha, in the words of the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, vast early America. And Andreas represents the best of that expansion. Andreas Resendez is a professor of history and an author who grew up in Mexico City, where, as his website says, he went into politics for a brief period and served as a consultant for historical soap operas. <laughs> and I have not yet had a chance to ask him what that means, but I'm dying to know more about that. He currently teaches at the University of California, Davis, where he has been since 1998, and in 2021 was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, one of the highest honors for a humanities scholar in the United States. He is a prolific and widely admired writer, the author of four books, including the field-changing book, The Other Slavery, the uncovered story of Indian enslavement in America which was a finalist for the 2016 National Book Award and winner of the 2017 Bancroft Prize, which all historians are very jealous of. <laughs> the book lays out in brutal detail the forgotten history of some two to five million indigenous people, mostly women and children, who had been enslaved between 1492 and the end of the 19th century in a system every bit as terrible degrading and vast as African slavery, as Andreas tells us, and whose story reminds us, as he does it himself throughout this book, that slavery is not just a thing of the past, but that we live with it today. It was praised at the time as a book that would, quote, change the course of an entire field and upset the received notions and received knowledge of the generations, end quote. And I can attest, as a scholar, it did that. It did that for me, and it has done that for my students. It has been a field-changing book. Andreas's most recent book, Conquering the Pacific, An Unknown Mariner and the Final Great Voyage of the Age of Discovery, 2021, is a wild romp through the environmental and geopolitical history of the Pacific Coast in the Age of Discovery. It's a story of a harrowing voyage from Mexico to Asia and back again, undertaken by a black mariner in 1565 as part of a secret mission by the Spanish to break Portugal's trade monopoly with Asia. Written with great verve, the book is an epic tale of mutiny, murder, and mayhem. It is a real page turner. The project that he's embarked on now, which he's working on at this year at the Huntington, grew out of this earlier work. From a single fraught colonial voyage, Andreas is now writing a sweeping study of the 500-year history of US Pacific exchanges, covering everything from crops to silver to people. How, he asks, did America and China go from enthusiastic, enthusiastic trading partners to strategic rivals? That is a very timely question if you're following the news at all. And I'm honored to turn the podium over to Professor Andreas Resendez for his talk entitled, The Magellan Exchange, How America and China Have Made Each Other. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Andreas. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Sue Juster, for this gracious uh, introduction, undeserved, of course. Um, I want to just take a second to uh, express my deep gratitude for uh, these years that I've been able to spend here at the Huntington 
I mean, the unmatched collections, the beautiful gardens, and the uh, camaraderie, and the scholarly exchange is just uh, tremendous. So I, uh, I, I will take that forever. Um, so today, the topic is the Magellan Exchange. And uh, I will start by uh, saying that when we uh, think of long-lasting connections between the East and the West, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, the Silk Road. Um, as the recent Chinese initiative makes abundantly clear, the Silk Road continues to serve as a signifier of relations across, across the globe. But there has been another historic point of contact between East and West, and this one across the Pacific. It is far less known than the Silk Road, yet, as I will try to argue tonight and try to show briefly, it has been more consequential to us here in the Americas, um, obviously, uh, possibly to China and quite possibly to the world at large. And this exchange across the Pacific has been continuous and has lasted for close to 500 years by now. So not quite as ancient as the Silk Road, but still, you know, 500 years is something. Um, out of those 500 years, the first two and a half centuries were largely courtesy of the Spanish Empire. And let me just uh, spend a second talking about this. Uh, in the middle of the 16th century, Spain pioneered a route back and forth across the Pacific. It was quite a difficult undertaking and a great adventure um, and the subject of, of my previous book, as Sue was mentioning. Um, and so that, that book kept me thinking about what happened next. Um, after that uh, watershed moment, that milestone uh, that occurred in 1564, 1565, um, you would have uh, galleons going every year from the port of Acapulco to Manila and back. And it was uh, an especially a, a major milestone because if you can think about this, for tens of millions of years, the Pacific Ocean had been a great barrier to the movement of virtually all, uh, you know, all uh, uh, animals, humans, plants, objects, and ideas. Um, and these barriers suddenly came down in 1565, um, and uh, and so um, and so this is the you know the result of this is what we're going to be uh, talking about today. Now, sailing across the Pacific is uh, very difficult, as you would imagine, anybody who has attempted that. Uh, the Pacific is twice as large as the Atlantic. Uh, so the galleons actually, uh, once they discovered this route back and forth, they kind of stuck to that very same route over and over. There were a few, uh, a few novelties here and there, but for example, that explains why uh, these galleons did not discover Hawaii, which would have been a major discovery. But Hawaii went undiscovered uh, because of the particularities of this route that I want to uh, discuss in a second. So the, uh, the Manila Galleon es essentially started in the port of Acapulco, oops, sorry, uh, in the port of Acapulco right here, um, which lines up, it's in the same latitude, so the same north to south uh, distance as Manila, so it was a straight shot following um, favorable currents and winds that took uh, these Spanish galleons straight to the Philippines. Um, the voyage lasted an average of three months uh, in the 16th century. It lengthened to four months in the 17th century because of some environmental changes, which is kind of interesting, but we don't have time to go into that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but still, you know, it was not too bad. The only stepping stone along the way uh, in this enormous voyage was in the island of Guam, which is one of the Mariana Islands, which um, uh, you can see right here. This is a north to south chain of islands. It, the map doesn't show it very well, but the galleons ba basically stopped there for a day or two, basically to top up provisions and get some water. Uh, this is four-fifths of the way to the Philippine archipelago, and then from Guam, they continued on to Manila. 
So, uh, so from Manila, the return voyage was much longer. It would take typically six months and it could take up to seven or eight or nine months. Uh, the reason for that is that it was not quite as direct, so galleons needed to navigate way to the north in order to catch uh, favorable conditions, uh, winds and currents again, to, uh, to return. And there was no single uh, landing spot anywhere on this trip. Uh, if they would stop at all before Acapulco, that would happen right around here in Southern California. So as you know, the coast of California has some pretty dangerous rock outcroppings or farallones, so galleons typically wanted to stay away from those. Um, but, uh, but sometimes they did stop in, uh, in uh, Cabo San Lucas, so Los Cabos as they are known now in Baja California and then on to Acapulco. So this was basically the, uh, the route. Uh, these galleons made an estimated 788 individual voyages in the course of two and a half centuries. So, um, so you can imagine uh, some of these uh, galleons were 500, 700, 1,000 uh, tons of burden. Uh, so they could carry a lot of stuff. They could carry a lot more stuff than you could carry in a caravan of camels and horses, for example. Um, and Acapulco and Manila, uh, they, to us in the present, they, uh, they, don't, they don't seem like primary uh, ports. So Acapulco is a tourist destination that has seen better days. And Manila is customarily outshined by, I don't know, Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. But back in the day, in the colonial period, these were truly continental funnels. So Manila, for example, gathered uh, merchants from India, from China, from Southeast Asia uh, to trade with the American continent. And the wares that they brought diffused from Acapulco all through the American continent. So merchants from Peru and elsewhere made their way to Acapulco in order to have access to these goods from Asia. So truly uh, continental uh, funnels that enable trade from one continent to another on either side of the Pacific. Now, um, if we focus for a moment on the, on the island of Guam, we can get a first inkling of the power of these exchange, these Magellan exchange. So as I just mentioned, Guam was the only regular stepping stone of the galleons along the way. Um, and even though the galleons spent as minimum time as possible, the anchorage in Guam was less than, less than good. It was actually pretty crappy. So, uh, so, they, so you know, galleon captains wanted to spend as little time as possible there, uh, just enough to deliver the mail and get some water and some provisions. But the consequences were nonetheless devastating. So Guam is more than 7,000 miles away from the coast of North America, yet fully one-third of the invasive, pl invasive plant species in Guam come from this continent. The most abundant plant in central and northern Guam is probably a tree origina originating in Mexico, the Waje tree. It's the, the tree that gives the name to the state, Mexican state of Oaxaca. Uh, and it is known in, uh, in, in Guam and also in the Philippines as Tangan Tangam tree. It's a very invasive, it makes the list of the 100 most invasive plants in the world. So, uh, so it took over Guam. And this was not the only thing. Uh, the Spanish galleons also introduced hoofed animals. Uh, we can talk about many, but the most destructive, probably by far, uh, were pigs. So pigs with their uh, wallowing and uh, trampling of the local plants uh, really uh, created quite a bit of erosion in Guam. And of course, with no natural predators, uh, pigs took over the island of Guam and other islands, uh, nearby islands, the Mariana Islands. Uh, so pigs, um, uh, multiply faster than other domestic animals. Um, they are extremely adaptable, and if they escape from farms or they are released intentionally, they will become feral and very well established. And so even today, or I mean as recently as 200, 2002, an estimated 38 feral pigs per square kilometer still existed on the island of Guam. Most dramatic of all was the arrival of new vectors of disease in the form of rodents and insects. Scholars have yet to write a comprehensive environmental history of Guam, but it is obvious 
that the uh, decades following Spain's permanent occupation of the island in the late 17th century were truly catastrophic for the islanders, uh, known to the Spanish as chamorros. So, uh, so the first Europeans to arrive in Guam was actually Magellan, who essentially stumbled on the island as he, as he was doing the circumnavigation, the famous circumnavigation voyage in 1525, I'm sorry, 1521. And he didn't give a specific number to the number of chamorros, but he mentioned casually that they were in the tens of thousands. By uh, 1710, so the Spanish, as I said, they established, they continued visiting Guam uh, periodically at, at some point, but more intensely once the galleons became established, and then finally the, the Spanish uh, established themselves uh, in, the, uh, in the 1670s and 1680s, building a fort, um, a mission, and a settlement. Uh, by 1710, only 3,000 chamorros remained alive. And a decade later, half of that number. So clearly, we're talking about a cataclysmic population decline uh, for, uh, you know, in a relatively short period of time. So that's the power of these Magellan Exchange. So, so Wham offers an early illustration of the destructive power of this exchange, but it was not all about destruction. Also very highly productive American plants such as corn and sweet potatoes, also crossed the Pacific and transformed East Asia. So uh, between the 16th and the 20th century, corn spread to every single province in China and nearly every single sub-provincial unit or prefecture, um, as you can see from these uh, slides, uh, from these map from Chen and Kung. Um, so, we may think of corn as a plant, but we should all m mostly think about it as a kind of an engineered botanical juggernaut. So corn uh, is descended from a wild grass uh, found in, in and around central Mexico called teosinte. And if you do a side-by-side -side comparison between teosinte and corn, I mean, it, all, it doesn't seem like they are the same plant at all. So the uh, teosinte has very small edible grains and they are covered by a very tough encasing. In the case of corn, we have a multiplication of these grains and the encasing has almost disappeared. It's called the glooms. So the glooms is that little transparent pellicle that gets stuck in your teeth when you eat corn. Uh, so it had nearly disappeared uh, because of these engineering over 9,000 years of domestication in the Americas. So we, we must think about it as, a, as, a, as I said, as an engineered plant. It cannot reproduce on its own. It requires human intervention. You don't find corn on the wild. Uh, but uh, even though it kind of depended on humans, it uh, took over the Americas. So it's, the distribution in the Americas is amazing from Canada all the way to the tip of South America and it grows in deserts and, and et cetera. And so this monster of a plant crossed the Pacific and um, had tremendous impact on China uh, and you know, the Far East uh, more broadly. Um, it was especially uh, um, important because corn opened up the a new agricultural frontier in China by allowing farmers to settle mountainous regions not suitable for rice cultivation or wheat cultivation. And so, uh, so it opened up a new, uh, new uh, areas to, to, be, uh, to, be, to be cultivated. And so in the 16th and 17th century, China still had uh, forests or many forests, and many of those were cut, cut down, especially in the 18th centuries and 19th centuries, to make room for cornfields. Um, so, uh, um, so, so corn is well adapted for mountain cultivation because it is a very deep rooted plant, not easily washed away by the rains. And corn is also, and I'll, I'll stop here, corn is very versatile as it can be consumed directly. It can be used as animal feed. It can be fermented into a liquor. It can be preserved. Um, and so not surprisingly, corn uh, became a new thing in China. And relatively few people know this, but today, uh, China's largest crop by volume is not rice, a crop that is almost synonymous with Chinese civilization. I mean, planted over there for 8,000 years or something like that, but corn. Corn, uh, corn uh, remains underappreciated in China, even invisible, 
but corn is nonetheless the pri uh, you know primarily used in China as animal feed. Uh, as many of you know, China crossed the 50% urbanization threshold back in, in 2012. Um, and so as China is undergoing this rapid urbanization, uh, they develop a taste for, uh, for more animal protein. And so corn was used as animal feed. Or uh, it is used as an input for vast supply chains to make alcohol or sweeteners, uh, sweeteners um, and others. So, so corn really has truly transformed China in very fundamental ways over the last 500 years. And another highly productive American plant that really revolutionized Asia and China was the humble sweet potato. Uh, again, it's a vine domesticated four or 5,000 years ago in Northern South America. Uh, but the sweet potato is a marvel to behold. Uh, so if humans had to survive on a single food source Potatoes would be a good choice. So maybe some of you saw the film The Martian, uh, in which Matt Damon became stranded in the Red Planet and was forced to survive on potatoes for years. I don't mean to be picayune about this, but most nutritionists would agree that Matt Damon would have been better off surviving on sweet potatoes uh, with the additional content of calcium and above all, a much higher content of vitamin A. So the entire plant is edible, the, the leaves, the stems, and of course the very nutritious tuberous root. It is extremely easy to propagate by cutting uh, or, uh, and planting pieces of the plant, both the tuberous root, but, but maybe also the stem. It is very resistant to insect infestations, and it does very well in, uh, you know, even in very bad weather, even in hurricanes and typhoons. So in East Asia, sweet potatoes became the ultimate vegetable insurance and a source of nutrition for millions of Chinese peasants. And what is more, um, the Chinese imperial government, which was very proactive in trying to mitigate uh, droughts or floods, which are the two most common uh, uh, sources of disasters in China, used sweet potato as a tool to combat uh, these problems as economist Rui Shui Jia has shown in, in her work. Um, so these highly productive New World crops were really catalyst for China's population expansion. So you can see a graph of China's, uh, China's uh, growth, um, and you can see that there's an inflection point around the 18th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries when these American plants are uh, spreading at a furious rate in China. Of course, I don't mean to say that these very productive New World plants were the only thing. Um, you know, there were other factors driving China's population growth, like the availability of land or the, uh, the ability of the Chinese government to intervene. You know, they learned over the years. Um, but even in these cases, these New World plants are implicated, right? So, so corn opened up additional lands that were not available before the introduction of corn, or sweet potato made the government, the Chinese government, better at mitigating these disasters. So, so clearly these were a very significant, everybody, most everyone would agree that these were pretty significant factors driving China's population. Okay, so we have talked about New World plants shifting China's demographic trajectory, at least, you know, being important in this process. But transformation went both ways across the Pacific. Uh, China's large and expanding population during the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries uh, could not help but cause ripple effects across the ocean. And the best known example is that of silver. Of course, uh, so China was one of the first countries to use fiat money, that is little pieces of paper that are worthless intrinsically, but are nonetheless viable, valuable, I'm sorry, uh, because the government said so. And this remarkable monetary system, however, ultimately uh, led to lack of confidence and hyperinflation. And so for complicated reasons, uh, China switched and uh, decided to abandon this fiat uh, currency and uh, many Chinese turned to, uh, to silver as a form of payment and a, as a form to store value. Um, and so, uh, so China uh, uh, 
you know, had some silver mines. So this initially helped with the silverization of China, but not nearly enough for the incredible demand that China, uh, that China had for the white metal. And so they uh, needed to import vast amounts of silver from the outside. And so as many of you know, uh, China started importing silver first from Japan. There were some very dramatic silver strikes in Japan in the 1520s. Uh, and even though China and Japan theoretically had some could not trade directly, uh, a lot of Japanese silver flowed into China. Uh, but eventually, uh, China imported uh, much of the silver from the largest deposits of silver in the world, which were in the American continent. So between 1500 and 1800, Peru and Mexico produced about 75 to perhaps 85% of the silver extracted around the world, and a good proportion of this ended up in China. This uh, transfer of silver from the New World to China occurred in two streams. One stream was directly across the Pacific uh, through the galleons. So the galleons, uh, so again, this is very difficult to measure because there is a lot of illegality around this. But uh, if we take an intermediate position of two to four million pesos worth of uh, silver going across. So we're talking about, I, I tried to do the conversion at those prices. We're talking about carrying 12 to 25 elephants, the weight of 12 to 25 elements worth of silver uh, each year, if you can imagine this, um, across, uh, across the Pacific. Um, but uh, silver also went to China indirectly. So, uh, so China went for, first to Europe. So this is the story, for example, I growing up in Mexico City, I was told, so the, the silver from the Mexican mines ended up in Europe, but it did not stay in Europe too long, or not, not all of it. Much of it ended up through further intermediation going to Asia. Uh, some of it went to India where Silver commanded a higher price than in Europe, but, uh, but much of it ended up in China, which uh, had even higher prices than India for, uh, for silver. So economic historians sometimes refer to uh, China as the silver sink of the world, but here I would like to uh, briefly refer to the silver tap that is the, the places that are producing the silver. And the point, the only point that I have here is without China's massive and long lasting demand for silver, the American mines would never have attained the scale that they did. The largest one was the mine of Potosi that you can see right there in the Viceroyalty of Peru. And at its peak uh, in the early 17th century, this remote and forbidding mountain in the Andes produced as much silver as practically all the other silver mines in the world combined. People flocked to this mountain of silver, creating an instant city of 160,000 inhabitants. So this is one of the largest cities in the early modern world. So it's larger than Seville or, you know, uh, or Venice. Um, and so what you have to imagine, and, so the, and these people are incongruously living at more than 13,000 feet in elevation. So probably some of you have been to Potosi. So it is, I mean, to get it to, for us to wrap our heads around this, is as if the entire city of Pasadena and Altadena were to move to some of the highest elevations in the California Sierras. So this is basically what we're talking about. Mexico also developed silver mines. Uh, Mexico never had a gigantic silver mine on the scale of Potosí, but it developed a cluster of lesser mines. So five very large mines, 20 secondary mines, and dozens of silver strikes basically propelled Mexico into becoming the largest supplier of silver. So, so Potosí was the largest supplier of silver in the world in the 16th and early 17th centuries, but Potosí's output declined, and they were overtaken by this cluster of Mexican uh, mines. And so by the second half of the 18th century, fully half of all the silver extracted on Earth are coming from these silver mines that you see on your screen. So uh, had China decided to use gold, and China had used gold and as well as silver uh, in addition to paper currency and bronze coin, etc. Had China decided to go with gold rather than silver, then the history of the world would have been very different. 
maybe West Africa would have experienced the massive boom experienced by Mexico and, uh, and Peru, or perhaps the gold rushes that unfolded in California and Australia in the 19th century would have started in the 16th or the 17th centuries. As it was, China's decision to use silver as a means of exchange and store of value turned colonial Latin America into a gigantic silver extracting operation with consequences that are visible even today. Now, at the start of this presentation, I mentioned that 250 years of this Magellan exchange across the Pacific was courtesy of the Spanish Empire through the Manila Galleon. The last 250 years have been courtesy of many different nations, but primarily of the United States. Uh, so the U.S. erupted into the Pacific in the late 18th century, and by then, just to get a, a sense of what we're talking about, China constituted an overwhelming 36% of the world's population. So one of every three humans alive at the time. So it is hard to overstate this reality. Uh, so today, by comparison, for example, China's share of the world population is about 18 or 19%. So roughly half of what it was at the time when the United States entered the Pacific world. So we have to, to, to keep the sense of proportion. Uh, you know, the US had barely crossed 4 million people and China was approaching 300 million at that point. You know, in the, uh, so intriguingly, uh, China, only wanted a few commodities from the outside. We've talked about silver, which was one of them, but furs, uh, especially sea otter furs, was another one. It was a very prized item um, in China. And China's demand for furs ballooned, especially in the 18th century. You may think that, well, a, you know, a very a third of humanity wanting furs, and Chinese, the Chinese had been wearing furs for millennia, would constitute a, you know, a very large market. But really the reason for that is, goes beyond that. Uh, there was essentially a new emphasis on furs that started uh, with the establishment of the, of the new rulers, the Manchu rulers, the Qing dynasty, in the middle of the 17th century. Um, and these uh, individuals came from what is now e to the northeast of China, beyond the, the Great Wall. Uh, they initially spoke a very different language, they ate very different foods, and they dressed very differently. And to emphasize their equestrian roots, uh, they used uh, riding boots and they also, uh, you know, uh, wore furs of different kinds. So, uh, so eventually these Manchu rulers adapted to the majority Han population, their newfound subjects, but they continued to insist on certain uh, markers of Manchu identity, and furs were one of them. And in fact, the Chinese court actually issued uh, sumptuary laws about what furs were appropriate for different ranks of uh, people. Um, and, um, and so this created some demand for these furs as uh, historian Jonathan Schlesinger and others have shown. Um, so the effects of these sartorial choices were profound. Uh, so one of the most, um, and let me go back to this, one of the most uh, prized furs in China uh, was, uh, and Tibet was that of sea otters. And sea otters have the densest furs of any uh, known species. Um, and initially these sea otter skins flowed to China uh, from the Asian side of the North Pacific, especially from Korea and Japan and the Kuril Islands. But starting in the 1740s, uh, some of these sea otter furs started flowing from the American side of the Pacific. Um, and so this is how uh, different uh, countries, first Russia, but then Britain, Spain, uh, all got into the act and they traded or negotiated or coerced uh, indigenous peoples into you know, pr procuring these furs and taking them to China. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, these, so you can see here the uh, range of these, uh, of these animals. Uh, 
you know, modern biologists based on modern sea otter populations and also based on car carrying capacity have estimated that perhaps a quarter of a million otters existed uh, between the Aleutian Islands up there, up, up here, all the way to the coast of Alaska, down to British Columbia, you know, Washington State, Oregon State. There was a little bit of a gap in Oregon and then all the way south to California and Baja California. This was their range. Um, and uh, even though all of these countries became involved, the United States ended up uh, dominating these uh, trade in furs. Um, again, as, as many scholars, Brian Tucker Jones, Adele Ogden, David Igler, and others have shown. Um, and, uh, and what is really interesting, if you do a back of the envelope calculation of the number of otters sent to China during the, the height of this trade, which was the, maybe the last decade of the 18th century, the 1790s, and the 1800s and the 18 teens, they started becoming scarce in the 1820s. Um, you know, you can see that upwards of 200,000 uh, of these sea otters uh, ended up being shipped to, to China. So clearly, uh, Chinese demand for, for sea otters for furs had an enormous impact on, uh, on this entire thing. And it also had uh, an entire impact on the United States itself. I mean, it is very easy for us in the 21st century to take for granted that, of course, the United States will become involved. And of course, the United States will emerge uh, you know, with the lion's share of this business. But uh, think about it. The, uh, the, uh, the English colonies, the former English colonies at the time were way out on the other side of the world. Um, so, uh, you know, the passage from Boston to the mouth of the Columbia River, for example, which was one of their favorite sites to get sea otters, uh, by way of South America took six six months or more aboard very diminutive vessels employed by New Englanders, um, simply put, uh, the western coast, um, the, the northwest coast was more challenging to reach than even India or China. I mean, it was really uh, an adventure. That's number one. And number two, once American sailors reached the northwest coast, they found the conditions forbidding. Uh, the Pacific Northwest, as you know, is surprisingly cold, has strong winds that are challenging to sail, as anyone who sails will know. The fog is always a threat. And of course, the coastal inhabitants defend their territories uh, jealously. And so, uh, and worst of all, as far as the, these Americans were concerned, the West Coast lacked uh, what they considered proper provisions. So natives in these plays lived off the bounty of the sea, fish, shellfish, etc., combined with a wide variety of plants, nuts, and weeds. But as far as Euro-American Euro agriculturalists were concerned, there were no basic staples like wheat or corn or potatoes or breadfruit, except in the Spanish missions and presidios, and so the very pivotal role played by California. Um, despite these tremendous difficulties, and starting in the late 1780s, American merchants visited the Northwest Coast in California often multiple times per year. And the only reason they went to such lengths was to procure furs for the China market. So clearly this gives us a, a very clear indication of the, the fact that the initial presence of the US out here in the Pacific Basin was largely shaped by the China trade. And uh, the China trade also shaped other aspects of the American presence around here. For instance, although multiple uh, ships visited the West Coast in the 1790s and the 1800s, they tended not to sink roots in the area because they were, above all, China traders. That's an activity that, that required not sinking roots, but actually moving from one place to another. They would fire shots or somehow call the attention of the indigenous peoples to trade for the furs and then move on. Instead of settling on the west coast of America, these early American visitors turned Hawaii into their supply base and a winter residence. A startling choice considering that Hawaii lays about 2,500 miles away from, from out here. So it is as if somebody decided to use the, the Portuguese Acers as a base to conduct uh, 
business with the coast of New England, for example. Um, but so Hawaii's warm climate and good harbors and abundance of food surely played a role in this decision to use Hawaii as a, as a base. But its location, very strategic location between America and China mattered just as much. And it's yet another demonstration of how the China trade shaped the exact configuration of the American presence in the Pacific. And finally, of course, these constant visits to the Pacific region also sparked an interest on the part of the United States to find a route overland from the East Coast to the Pacific. Multiple reasons, we don't have time to go through all the reasons that impelled Jefferson and the US Congress to finance an expedition to accomplish just that, right? The Lewis and Clark expedition. But the China trade loomed large as scholars like Michael Block and others have shown. So the Lewis and Clark expedition was meant at least in part uh, or at least in coordination with the burgeoning trade in the Pacific as it's clear from its exact route, right? So the expedition started from St. Louis, Missouri, which was America's great interior entrepot and ended up on the Pacific coast at no other place than the mouth of the Columbia River, which was a place that had been visited for over a decade by that point uh, by sea otter fur traders. And it had emerged as a very critical node in the China trade. In fact, uh, in the instructions to Lewis and Clark, one of the possibilities was for them to return not by land as they did, but to return with some uh, sea otter fur traders. So by opening this line of communication through the continent, Jefferson intended to funnel the furs being collected in the Missouri and Mississippi rivers to a port on the Pacific for shipment to the largest pelt market in the world, China. And, uh, and after returning to Washington, in fact, uh, Meriwether Lewis confided to one of his colleagues that, and I quote him, the signal advantage of the entire expedition would be the establishment of a trading post at the mouth of the Columbia River for expediting the commerce in furs to China. So again, China looms very large in all of this. In the, uh, so um, so the, the main point that I, and, and I want to close this chapter here, uh, the main point that I want to uh, talk about here is that the presence of China, this very uh, you know, very precocious China trade really uh, prompted the United States to establish a present out in the Pacific. Um, so, you know, when we think of the history of the United States, we think of continue, contiguous territorial expansions from the, you know, what were the British colonies, first to what is sometimes known as the first American frontier, then across the Mississippi, then through the Rocky Mountains, and finally to the far west. But when we look closely at how the process unfolded, back in the late 18th century, we have this tremendous leap all the way to the Pacific. And we have the presence of literally thousands of Americans up and down the west coast of the Americas, uh, reaching a region that would have gone decades without being visited by an American had it not because of this China trade. So, uh, so China's love of pelts greatly accelerated this process of the United States becoming a bicoastal nation. Um, and, uh, and it really uh, you know, it makes us think about this notion of the United States um, as a nation that grew by contiguous territorial expansion. In the absence of the China trade, it is possible, even likely, that the United States would have eventually reached the western edge of the continent through piecemeal territorial acquisitions, but China's love of pelts greatly accelerated this process. Now, these are just a handful of examples of how the Magellan Exchange across the Pacific have powerfully shaped the Americas and China. And I would like to conclude uh, this with two brief thoughts. First, uh, we can think of the Magellan Exchange as a sibling to the better known Columbian Exchange across the Atlantic. Since great school, uh, many of us have heard about, heard about the Columbian Exchange and how the American tomatoes transformed the cultures and cuisines of Europe, like Spanish gazpacho or the Italian pizza, or how the Peruvian potato was instrumental to the survival of the Irish. 
Uh, but still the signal event of the Colombian exchange was the decimation of the indigenous peoples of the Americas, uh, exposed to germs for which they had no resistance. So Europeans introduced illnesses that resulted in so-called virgin soil epidemics. The Magellan Exchange across the Pacific, as, as we have uh, briefly explored, had its own dynamics that were strikingly different from the Colombian Exchange. Yes, Europeans introduced germs into island environments like Guam and the Philippines, but they also introduced highly productive American crops like corn, sweet potatoes, potatoes, peanuts, and others that uh, drove great population booms in, in the Far East and especially in China. Today, China is the second largest producer of corn in the world, just after the United States. China and India are the top two producers of peanuts, and Papua New Guineans obtain more calories per person from sweet potatoes than any other people around the world. And so the Magellan Exchange across the Pacific was different the, from the Colombian Exchange across the Atlantic and had its very different and its own very different dynamics. So that's one thought. The second and final thought that is that even though the story of the Magellan Exchange that I have been laying out here has to do with pioneering voyages and powerful nations. The most af affected by these Trans-Pacific Exchanges were ordinary peoples, especially indigenous peoples. So Chamorros in Guam were afflicted by new diseases introduced by Europeans. Ordinary Chinese farmers adopted exotic plants like corn and sweet potatoes to survive. Native Americans and Africans, African slaves were pulled into the fast-growing silver mines of Mexico and Peru um, to meet China's need for silver, and coastal Native Americans hunted sea otters due to a change in China's fashion. So then and now, vast exchanges affect ordinary peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you. So, should I? Thank you. Yes, yes. thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, so, we have 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Um, would you like to field them yourself? I can field okay. them myself. Okay. Thank you. So, the floor, the floor is open. Can you thank have you. the lights up a little bit? Yes. I just wonder what, what did the, uh, what was brought back from the West to the East? What did the Americas get in terms from of trade? In exchange for silver. That's a very good question, and I didn't include this. But uh, so these um, galleons, for example, were absolutely loaded to capacity. Uh, so on the way there, uh, they took only silver and friars. That was the refrain in colonial Mexico was the silver, the, I mean the galleons going there was silver and friars. Uh, the, uh, the return trip, uh, the galleons uh, were completely loaded with porcelain, with silk, uh, primarily these two, as well as some, uh, you know, uh, spices and, you know, a few, uh, uh, but, but I mean, the main thing was uh, porcelain and, um, and, uh, and uh, silk. Uh, just, just to, uh, let me, actually, I have, there is one, well, uh, you yeah, know, that would be overkill, but uh, the, the, uh, these uh, galleons, were so overloaded with these goods that uh, some economists argue that they sank at a higher rate than other long distance uh, you know, routes, like the Dutch, for example, because, they were, because the incentives were such that the merchants who owned the space in the ships uh, you know, needed, wanted to overload them with these goods as much as possible. And it also uh, tells you a little bit about China. China became a a vast manufacturing enterprise. So if you look, for example, at the characteristic blue and white porcelain that uh, China exported at this time, uh, a lot of it came from a single town in Jiangxi province, which is kind of interior province, 
um, and it is uh, exporting porcelain all over the Americas, to Africa, to Europe. I mean, if you use some of the paintings that they have here and, you know, in the Getty and everywhere, you, you will see these blue and white uh, Chinese porcelain, which is what they are exporting in order to, uh, in exchange for these silver. So, yeah, thank you. Yes. Did Polynesian navigators have any role in the pioneering of the Magellan Exchange? Oh, great. I'm glad you asked. So, um, yes, so, uh, so this is a fascinating part of the story that I don't know how to fit into all of this. But, uh, so basically, some of these plants and animals that we've been talking about uh, tell us uh, an, the even earlier story. So, uh, so, for example, you have coconuts appearing on the coast of Panama. So coconuts is a plant indigenous to, to Asia. So there are two domestication, two, probably two domestication, separate domestication events, one that occurred in India and one that occurred in Southeast Asia. The uh, Indian coconuts essentially circle the world, first going to Africa and then to the Atlantic, brought by, uh, by European explorers and African slaves. And this is the type of coconuts that ended up diffusing all the way through the, uh, you know, from Florida all the way to, to Brazil. The, on the other side, you have coconuts uh, spreading through the Polynesian islands um, and as we know, Polynesians arrive very close, well, very close, 2,500 miles away. So, for example, in Rapa Nui or, you know, Easter Island. Uh, and you have to wonder if they were able to locate these teeny tiny little islands in the middle of the ocean, how come they would have stopped there and they would not, they would have missed the entire American coast. So, so the presence of coconuts documented by the earliest Spanish colonist on the coast of Panama is one little piece of evidence that there may have been contact around the 12th of 13th century. Uh, similarly, we have sweet potatoes. I talked about the sweet potatoes. They also occurred in some of these islands, which again suggest a little bit of contact. But what's really amazing, if you go back to a paper in 2020, I believe, or 2021, um, there is DNA evidence of admixture between Polynesians and Native Americans, harking back to the 12th or 13th century. So, so yes, so, uh, so, so, this, so, so the, this contact occurred briefly in the 12th and 13th century, quite likely, almost surely, but it was a brief contact, and by the time the Europeans arrived, that contact had disappeared. Uh, once again. So yes, it has a place in this story, a very early, a very intriguing first uh, opening of the Pacific, so to speak, if you want to call it that way. So thank you. Yes. Um, what uh, evidence have you found of the maritime Jilwon people from Southeast Asia who traveled up through uh, uh, Taiwan and Japan uh, coming to uh, uh, the North America uh, before the, the Ice Age. Well, I mean, the so the 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 one so there there are many so there are different strands of DNA that they have tried to use in order to make these cases. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go into all the different you know little. So all all I want to do is, I mean, you're totally right that the, the diaspora, the diaspora that is fairly well documented both linguistically and with DNA evidence goes from the coast of China through Taiwan to the Philippines through some, you know, through uh, some to, you know, some of the, uh, the Solomon Islands and through, and so the, these Polynesians moving across. So that's a a great saga that started maybe 4,000 years ago, and you know it, it occurred by island hopping, and it culminated in these 12th or 13th century possible, likely contact with Native Americans, and that's that's the only one that I would like to focus on because I think that's the best documented. But you're right; there are other little bits of evidence of other possible migrations. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes. Could you say a little bit more about the push factors in China? 
So it seems like there's there's a moment that an engine starts. So can you say a little bit more about what's going on in China to create this giant market and need for furs and silver? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the uh, what's really d difficult for me in this project is that if we really want to understand uh, why the need to s for silver arose in China, you need to get into the nitty gritty of the history of China and its monetary policy. And if you want to uh, get into the story of why uh, furs became so demanded in China, you need to understand this transition from the Ming to the Qing dynasty and how furs were a part of this new dynasty and the way they presented themselves and who the Manchus were, etc. So, uh, so it is a, a, it's difficult to narrate, right? Because we are talking about things that shape the American continent that are very much rooted in the internal domestic history of a, of a nation very far away from us and vice versa, right? I mean, so again, we may go into the nitty gritty of why, uh, why, for example, silver actually stopped. Uh, so there was a lull of silver in the middle of the 17th century. And uh, this lull in silver has been explained in different ways by scholars. So some people think that there was a depression in the American colonies that led to a, to a lowering production of silver, which destabilized China, and that's what permitted this change from the uh, Ming to the Qing. I'm sort of, uh, you know, undersimplifying, but that, but the other possibility is exactly the opposite. So the transition in China was so disruptive with tens of millions of people dying uh, with this, in this transition that this may have, so it was a demand driven uh, uh, process in the Americas. So again, I don't, so, so the difficulty in writing this book is going to be in uh, keeping the faith of the reader in that some domestic events in a country that is very far away actually explain a lot of what's happening in a different country, in a, in a different continent in this case. So I don't, so I, I don't know that it, that is one push factor that I can see, but it's different, you know, circumstances with rooted in their domestic histories. Yeah. So, yes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And please join us outside for reception so we can continue the conversation and celebration of Andres Resendez. Thank you, Thank you so much.